Hello, my name is uh, Kostya Lopikhin and I'll talk about uh, partial evaluation. Uh, the slides for this talk, uh, I posted a link on uh, UAPICON uh, hashtag and Twitter, so if you like, you can download them and view them um, at your laptop. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll talk about first what is partial evaluation. Then we'll see uh, how and when should we apply it. Uh, then we'll talk about a real-world case study, and at the end we'll talk about if it's possible to implement partial evaluation in a library. So, first part, what is partial evaluation? Uh, it is an optimization technique where we generate specialized code using information that is available at runtime. And our hope is that this specialized code runs faster. Uh, so, here's a sample program that takes some input and produces some output. And as an example, here's a power function that rises x to the power of n. And sometimes uh, we can separate input into two parts, uh, dynamic part and static part. Uh, and dynamic part changes often and static part changes less often. In this example, there is some a uh, large array of data, and we calculate a fixed polynomial uh, on this data. So we always rise x to the power of to the third power or to the 47th power. And here, uh, n is either 3 or 47, so it can be considered static. And so we can perform this operation. We can uh, specialize our program. Now it knows about something about static input, and we have two functions, power 3 that rises to the third power, and power 47 that rises to the 47th power. Uh, and uh, this uh, specialized function should run faster. We'll see how it does. Uh, so here's an example of the power function. Uh, it's a recursive function that uh, tries to make as little multiplications as possible. It's not the best one, but it's uh, rather simple. So first it checks if it, it is past uh, an integer and it is positive, and then uh, it performs recursion. If, For example, if we need to multiply the eighth power, we can multiply the second, the fourth, and then the eighth power. Okay, now let's see how we can specialize it. Uh, if uh, n is just some string, then we can rise value error and be done. Uh, if we rise to the first power, it's trivial. We just return uh, x. Uh, well, the fifth power is more interesting. We can see the algorithm at work. Uh, here we first calculate the second power, then the fourth, and then we have just multiply by x to get the answer. Uh, and for the 27th power, uh, it is more involved, but the algorithm is the same. And let's see if it runs faster. Uh, okay, so here's the benchmark. Uh, we loop, we take integers from 0 to 19 and rise them to the thief's power. And we compare uh, our uh, generic function, then uh, specialized function, and native uh, power function. And we see that our specialized function runs almost 10 times faster but we still are a little bit slower than the native one. Then under PyPy, it's more interesting. Uh, first, it runs massively faster because here the algorithm is trivial and uh, numbers are slow, so it gets compiled to several assembler instructions, basically. But what is more interesting is that under PyPy, we get no speed up from partial evaluation. And why is that? Uh, it's because PyPy has a tracing JIT, and it starts tracing, it starts recording the operations your uh, program performs, and this trace is always linear. So PyPy tracing JIT, in this case, unrolls all your function calls, unrolls all this recursion, and so what it records looks similar to, to this. So the trace is linear, it just performs multiplications. That's why uh, under PyPy, here there is basically almost no benefit. But as we'll see later in more complex examples, PyPyJIT cannot figure everything out for us and we still benefit from it. And uh, another example, uh, if we rise to the 27th power, 
uh, we get also get a good speed up from partial evaluation. But what is more interesting is that we beat native Python power function uh, by almost, well, two and a half times. Why is that? Because the numbers start getting huge. So 19th to the 27th power is a big integer. And here, every long multiplication counts. And CPython and PyPy use the same algorithm. They switch from slow algorithm that does 27 multiplications to fast algorithm that does uh, much more complex uh, one. But here, mm, it is a bad spot for CPython and PyPy algorithm. So here, this naive algorithm outperforms uh, the native one, which is interesting. OK. And why d does it outperform? Here's the heat map uh, of the original power function. So uh, the darker the color, the more time it spends in that line. And we see that most of the time is spent doing utterly useless things. Most of the time is spent analyzing if uh, our n is an integer or if it's greater than 0. Then we spend a lot of time, again, analyzing n that is static as we uh, talked. And we spend very little time doing actual work. Why? That's why it is slow. And for this specialized function, we spend all the time doing multiplication. And that's why it's fast. So most of the time we spend doing the largest multiplication when we multiply 13th power by itself. So, uh, and how do we implement it? Well, uh, here, as we see, the control flow of two functions is quite different. So we must uh, generate the source code and then use uh, built-in functions uh, compile and eval to produce specialized code. And they compile your source code to bytecode, and then it is executed just like uh, normal uh, code under uh, Python. And here is the code that generates the source code. As you can see, it looks uh, really similar to the uh, original power. It also does recursion on uh, n. Uh, it also has two cases. And, but instead of doing real multiplication, it just generates the code that does multiplication. OK, so what we have seen that we made a, uh, a function that runs 10 times faster than the original one, but the code is rather messy. Uh, it, is, it takes two screens instead of one, and it is harder to understand. So, um, to sum it up, yeah, just what I said. Um, specialization can make your code run much faster, but it can become messy quickly. So, the question is, when should we do it, and when should we not? Well, uh, first we need to answer the question, why do we write in Python in the first place? Uh, well, if the algorithm would be as trivial as this power function, we wouldn't be writing Python. We would be writing in C or Assembler or some other low-level language. If we write in Python, it means that we need our algorithm is rather complex. We cannot just easily rewrite it in C. And uh, to apply specialization, we must also care about performance a lot. It must be important for us so we can introduce this complexity. And also, the problem itself, not all problems uh, can uh, lead to specialized solutions. Um, and, well, we must not forget about the larger context. So if you meet a performance, if you think you have performance problems, first you have to think maybe you shouldn't be solving them now. Maybe should, you should think about other things. Uh, you should profile first. You should think about the algorithm you are using. So from specialization, we can get a 10 times speed up. But by using different algorithm, you can speed up your problem millions of times. So, and you must have a good test coverage and benchmarks to see that you uh, didn't introduce any bugs and that you really sped up your program. Um, and well, what are the areas that uh, lend to good specialization results? Uh, interpreters of programming languages, of some business logic rules, of database queries, of spreadsheet calculations, and template engines. So, uh, what they, well, uh, what they have in similar that they are kind of interpreters. They interpret some fixed rules. And here, uh, the program that is interpreted is the static part, and the dynamic part is the input. 
uh, and so for example, the template you supply to a template agent is a static part, and the template agent uh, compiles it. So specialization turns interpreter into a compiler. Uh, but, well, there are some cases when you can use uh, easier techniques and gain, also gain impressive results. You can use caching, you can use closures and lazy evaluation. Uh, for example, uh, if you have some, uh, again, this is a function that takes static input and produces a specialized uh, function. And, well, it just does some, this, some expensive computation uh, and it runs it once and uh, then creates a function uh, uh, in a closure. And this function can use this uh, value variable. And this is much easier than generating code. But uh, the problem is that uh, you, there is no way to change the control flow. So uh, this caching and uh, evaluating in a closure does not change control flow. There is no way to turn this code into these. They are completely different and yet they represent the same computation. Okay, so to sum it up, uh, we can use uh, partial evaluation to interpreters or interpreter-like uh, problems, but really it's a very broad set of problems. And we have to test and benchmark and consider some easier methods. Okay. Uh, the third part is a real-world case study where we used partial evaluation to our benefit. Uh, the problem domain is uh, online uh, data processing engine and it does data collection. It, users can define their data structures, they can define uh, formulas, they can uh, build reports that use these formulas. Uh, and so the data is kept in a multi-dimensional, uh, some multi-dimensional structure. The formulas are really expressive. For example, you can uh, calculate Fibonacci sequence. You can, well, there's recursion, free variables, aggregation. Uh, and so it starts looking like a little programming languages, but users really need it. So it's like Excel, but multidimensional and which works with a lot of data. Okay, and what is the problem? Uh, this evaluation of formulas is a huge bottleneck. So we also do database queries, we also gener generate uh, templates, but this uh, evaluation of formulas is a huge, huge bottleneck. And it was already optimized. So we use all the usual optimization techniques, profiling, caching, etc. And as a result, there are no, there's no single bottleneck. The performance is, well, the problem spends a lot, a lot of time in different places, but there's no single one you can speed up. It just, it is just slow. It's just doing a lot of things like this. Uh, if we need to get some value, uh, so k variable represents some k in a multidimensional grid. Then we see if there are some formulas associated with this key. If we can apply them. If we can apply them, then it uh, checks um, on the next slide uh, how can we apply them. What other key values do we need? Uh, it, it is doing a lot of stuff analyzing these formulas and it is interleaved with actual computation. And it looks like an abstract syntax tree interpreter. And it's really hard to separate this uh, analy analysis of formulas and actual computation. And how do we uh, cope with it? Uh, we use a specialization, we take this uh, formulas as static input. They are supplied by the user, but once uh, he supplied them, there is a finite number of them, not a lot. And we generate something like this. Um, this code does only actual computations. It doesn't analyze the formulas. And what is interesting, uh, we also inline functions because inlining allows us um, to make further optimizations and re removes function calls. And uh, to simulate non-local return from the function, 
uh, we use a while loop that executes only one iteration and can use break to make a non-local exit. So we work around with not having go to in Python. And uh, another thing to note is that we can unpack this multidimensional key. So instead of key variable, we variable we have x, y, and z that represent the coordinates of this multidimensional key. And when we need uh, to use other uh, cells in our multidimensional grid, we just uh, refer to them directly without analyzing uh, the formula. Okay, and so what does it get us? Uh, total uh, amount of code of these calculation engines is about 2,000 lines of code. The part that is doing actual interpretation is only uh, 300, and uh, the code that does specialization is about the same size. And what is important, we have a, uh, 10 times, uh, it is 10 times faster, and it is no longer a bottleneck for us, which is important. And here are the benchmarks. So, well, I took some report that does recursion and aggregation and run it under CPython and under PyPy 1.9. And here we compare execution without partial evaluation and with partial evaluation. And you can see it both under CPython and under PyPy, it makes code run about 10 times faster, which is great for us. But uh, as we have seen, uh, we have also, we gain also some problems because uh, we get extra 400 lines in our code base. There are not, well, they were written, not very hard to write, but we have to support them. And how do we do it? First, we need good test coverage and we need regression tests on correctness and on performance. So uh, we, knew, we know immediately when we introduce some bug. Uh, also, uh, we will likely have to debug our code, and uh, there is also a way to debug specialized code. You just uh, output it to some file that you can see in your text editor. You can use uh, Python debugger inside it, so it's just like debugging normal Python code. Uh, also, well, a lot of new features were added since uh, we introduced specialization, and first, new features are added without specialization, so you write them um, as an interpreter, it is much easier. You can test it, you can see if you really need this feature, and after you implemented it, wrote tests for it, you can uh, make a specializer for them, and it is much easier to support. It's much easier to do it this way. And, well, maybe for some new features, you don't want to do specialization if they are rarely used or are not performance critical, so it's important that you, for us, it was really important that we keep both specialized and non-specialized version around. Okay, uh, so, well, to sum it up, partial evaluation can be really beneficial for you. Uh, you can, it can speed up your program a lot, but uh, you have to be careful. You have to approach it knowing what is ahead of you. So you'll have to Right, tests, you have to um, be careful here. Okay, and now the fourth part. Oops. Uh, how cool would it be to write something like this? We just generate, we don't have to write our, uh, this messy code that does um, code generation. We could just um, use the Pythonic way, use the library to do it for us and just say it, specialize my function. I know that n is, oh, is always five. Just make me a faster version. And well, is it possible to do it? Well, yes and no, we'll see later. Uh, okay, these libraries that do uh, partial evaluation for you were developed for Lisp dialects, for Schemi, uh, even for C. Uh, they were attempted for uh, Ruby language, um, there's a talk at RubyConf uh, 2009, but, well, it was, uh, in my mind, not very, really successful because the author tried to do full static analysis of your program, and it is very hard to do in dynamic languages. Uh, and there are, I have not found one for Python. Uh, 
and I decided to write one. Well, for Python, there is um, not a partial evaluation library, but there is a library that does uh, constant folding and constant propagation uh, at import time, but it cannot give you big performance improvements. It cannot transform your control flow. Okay, uh, so how does it work? Uh, it works on the abstract syntax tree level. It uh, transforms this abstract syntax tree, and it, as it, is opera it operates uh, on runtime, it can use a Python interpreter to evaluate uh, parts of the function that you know statically. Uh, so what is abstract syntax tree? It's a syntax tree that represents your program. Uh, for example, this is a, some simple silly function, and you can use, uh, you can use you can use uh, pi sorry. Okay. So here's this function. Yeah. Then uh, you can use built-in uh, AST and inspect models to get the abstract syntax tree of your function. And uh, there's a convenient model meta AST tools that can pretty print it. And what you get is. Um, a rather large, well, it is the syntax tree of uh, your function. It looks ugly at first, but you can spot that this is the function definition, its uh, parameters, then starts the body, it starts with an if clause, there is a if part, test part, and else part, so it just represents in a convenient way uh, the essence of your function. and. It's convenient to work on the abstract syntax tree level because you think in terms of code and uh, so you transform it. Another alternative would be to use bytecode, but I didn't try it, but I think it would be harder. Okay, and uh, there's also a convenient class node transformer in the abstract syntax tree library. Uh, and here's an example of a simple optimization. This is constant folding. You uh, see uh, if there is a variable that is used in the load context, so its value is used, and you just check if you know it. And if you know it and it is a number, you can r substitute the variable with a number. And it looks really simple. And, well, if it would be all that simple, then there would be such a library for sure. But it turns out there are some problems. Uh, Python, first problem is that Python supports uh, imperative programming. So you can change global state, you have local state, you have input-output that is, can appear anywhere, uh, your functions might have side effects, and so you have to be really careful when you do optimizations, because all these things can make your optimizations invalid and make your library buggy. And uh, users can also redefine methods, they can redefine operations, and you have to account for all of that, and that makes it hard. But uh, to simplify it, um, well, how do you fight with it? Uh, you do data flow analysis, so you see uh, how uh, different variables influence other variables inside your function. Uh, you detect when some function might be doing mutation uh, on your variable, and you pessimistically assume that if you have some unknown function, uh, then it might mutate your var variable. So here, uh, my approach differs from the uh, approach of the author of the Ruby variable. We are really pessimistic to ensure correctness, but it turns out that being pessimistic, well, you still can gain some useful results. Uh, and if we, well, we have some assumptions and we do, we transform this abstract syntax tree and if we notice some mutation later, then it makes all our transformations invalid. And we roll back to the start, uh, but we gain some information. We know that we should not change, we should not optimize this uh, variable, for example. And we start from scratch, knowing this, and produce a correct result. It's a simplistic approach. Uh, that, well, it's, it can lead to slow performance, but at least it is correct. It's, I think it's possible to make it correct. 
Um, Okay, and also, well, we assume that if you say to our library that this input is static, then you don't lie, you don't mutate it after you said it's static, because otherwise it would be impossible to do anything useful. You also help the library by declaring some functions as pure, so the, some functions that don't change global state. You also declare functions that you want in line with a decorator, it's easy to do so, and it simplifies the library a lot. And, uh, well, mostly it is a prototype. It doesn't do uh, complete uh, data flow analysis. Uh, it, it does a limited form of it, so I'm mostly sure that it can be extended to do full data flow analysis. And uh, here we'll see a simple demo. Uh, we see the function that uh, we uh, talked about in, at the beginning. It's the power function, and has its definition. And we also used inline decorator from the library uh, to mark this function that we should be able to inline. We test that it really works. It evaluates to some huge number, <laughs> but it's correct. And then, uh, on yeah, we can uh, stop here. We can uh, see. We use this library to generate a specialized function, power 27. We have to pass it the original function. We also have to pass it globals and local dictionaries. So the library knows in which environment your function was defined. Well, it looks ugly. Maybe there is a way to work around it. I don't know. And we pass. Uh, we say that we want to specialize on n, and that n equals 27. And so. Um, it prints, well, I introduced a global variable that says that we should also print uh, the result of this function. And here's the source code. Uh, it contains a lot of, uh, yeah, and we see that it really works. It produces the same result. And, uh, okay, can you scroll up? Можешь вернуться в Chrome и промотать чуть выше? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. It introduces a lot of uh, dummy variables, but there also used to be these variables we called POW13. Well, certainly the specializer doesn't know the meaning and it chooses some random names. And what is interesting to note here that uh, see the first line of the function, here is x multiplied by 1. Uh, it may seem like a bug, but actually it's a feature. Because if you don't know what x is, you cannot say that x multiplied by 1 equals x. We don't know the type of variable x, so we cannot assume that uh, it has not redefined the multiply, the mal method. And so we cannot optimize it away. But other optimizations we see are valid. We just perform multiplications. And uh, it uses about the same number of uh, well, actually, the same number of multiplications as our handcrafted function, and it works faster. Um, so here's this little demo. Uh, the code for the mm, the code lives uh, on GitHub. You can check it out. Well, I, I say that it's well, it works. It has tests. Uh, it all functionality is covered by tests, but it's incomplete now because. It doesn't handle all mutation cases, as it doesn't do full data flow analysis. But, well, I hope that it can be turned into something more useful. And I haven't tried applying it to uh, real-world programs, mm, for example, for our uh, engine yet, but I think I'll do it in the following weeks. Okay, um, so this is all. Do you have any questions? Um, 
Uh, it looks for me like uh, this code is hard to read, hard to learn, how to write it, then hard to read, hard to understand, then harder to maintain and support for other developers. So I'm wondering why not to just switch, for example, for C if your application is so slow and you, it's time to, to optimize it. For example, I'm using usually some caching policies or maybe just upgrading my hardware, but this approach looks for me quite hard to get and support. Don't you think so? Uh, well, uh, there are different cases. Um, there can be, certainly there can be situations where it is better to write uh, some code in uh, C than to uh, try to generate specialized code. But, uh, well, first, uh, I'm pretty sure that um, if we try to implement it in C, it would be much harder because well, there's uh, all this code uses a lot of uh, Python constructs that made, make Python uh, code really compact. It, well, and it would be really hard to write it. See, the code would be, well, I think more than, well, several thousand lines of code. Then uh, the cost of introducing C, if you have only Python code and you have no C code in your code base and you have no people that um, are fluent in C, then the cost of introducing C is much greater than the cost of uh, writing some, uh, well, more 300 lines of Python code. And, well, in our case, we could uh, test and um, we, uh, well, there were a lot of features, new, a lot of new features added by different developers. For example, uh, Mikhail, who is in the other hall, I think, uh, implemented free ver variables and there are also new features added. So in our case, it proved out to be a good solution, I think. I, well, we didn't try writing it in C because it is costly, but I think that it was here, it was the right solution. Uh, no, we have a production use cases. This system is used to uh, collect data uh, from the veterinary clinics uh, around um, uh, in the all regions of Russia. It is used by the, oh, Minsilhos, I don't know, the Ministry of, Ministerstvo Sielskoho Hazeistva, to also to collect uh, uh, daily and weekly data about uh, agricultural work and we are using it to uh, now uh, with Gazprom and Svisnoy to build uh, analytical engines for them. So it's used in production and it works. Uh, well, uh, I spent, I think, well, maybe a month do thinking if I should do it or not, not, not doing anything then two days or maybe three days writing this code that does specialization and then it just works. So there were almost no bugs in the specialized code, so it was not very hard. Oh, the speed up, 10 times speed up. It's not the overall speed up, it's the speed up of this, uh, the part that does actual uh, evaluation, but uh, before it was a bottleneck, so overall speed up ranges from, well, from 10 times to maybe two times, depending on the type of the report. 